Well, it's my great pleasure and my extreme honor to have been able to bring Robert Spencer to Montreal. I'm not going to make a big long speech because I think everybody who's here is really, really aware of the work that Robert does. And to me, Jihad Watch, if you only read one thing every day, you read Jihad Watch. This is a learned scholar and an unbelievable, his knowledge of the Koran, I know you've all read it, <laughs> by the time the brothers finish speaking, you're all going to be rushing out to your local mosque and buying one. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, without any further ado, please give a warm welcome to the one and only Robert Spencer. Thank you very much, and thank you so much for coming out to this uh, very secretive meeting. <laughs> and <Another one. laughs> it has to be a clandestine secret meeting because, of course, of the way the political winds are blowing and some of the developments that have been taking place recently, particularly in regard to the freedom of speech. And I thought that it would be perhaps enlightening to some of you tonight if we discussed exactly what is going on in regard to the freedom of speech and what has happened to it and what is the attempt, what the, what the Islamic entities in the world are attempting in regard to it. And this goes back many years. But I think epitomizing what's happening are several very emblematic incidents. One was on 9-11 when Mohammed Atta, one of the hijackers, probably the leading hijacker in terms of the uh, visibility that he has attained since the hijacking, and I think everybody's probably familiar with his cold dead eyes and his face and that photograph that surfaced after the attack when he was piloting the plane that he had hijacked and before he had crashed it into one of the World Trade Center towers, he went onto the uh, speaker system and he said to the passengers, stay quiet and you'll be okay. Stay quiet and you'll be okay. And of course then he crashed the plane into the building. A few years after that, Theo Van Gogh, Theo Van Gogh, was the producer of a film submission about the oppression of women in the Islamic world that featured nude women with verses of the Quran written on their bodies, which was of course very highly offensive to Muslims because of not the nude women but the desecration of the Quran by placing the Quran text on the body of a nude woman, which is something that is unclean and to be despised. And so Theo van Gogh was murdered on a street in Amsterdam by a Muslim named Mohammed Bouyeri, who first shot him while he was riding his bicycle down the street in Amsterdam, and then came close and attempted to behead him, but had trouble doing so, and eventually stabbed the knife into the body with a hit list attached to the knife of other people that he, that he intended to kill or thought that other Muslims should kill. And in the process of doing all this, Theo van Gogh, before he died, said to Bouyeri, can't we talk about this? And of course, we could not, and he was killed. The point being that what the Islamic world wants to do to the West is summed up by what Atta said, stay quiet and you'll be okay. And what the West says in response is, can't we talk about this? And no, we cannot. And increasingly, Western authorities are agreeing and saying, we can't talk about this. And we have to just stay quiet and we'll be okay. But we will not be okay if we stay quiet any more than the people on the plane that Atta had hijacked were. And this was shown as far back as Valentine's Day 1989 when the Islamic Republic of Iran sent a valentine to the novelist Salman Rushdie. And of course you're all familiar with that. Salman Rushdie was sentenced to death in a fatwa, a religious decree, by the Ayatollah Khomeini because he had written a novel called The Satanic Verses. Now you may not be aware that The Satanic Verses is an actual incident in the life of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, as delineated by Islamic tradition that in Islamic sources, it tells this story, that Muhammad was a member of a tribe of Arabs who lived in Mecca called the Quraysh. And the Quraysh 
were pagan polytheists who had 300, they worshipped these three goddesses, Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat. And Alat, Al-Uzza, and Manat were three of 360 gods that had idols in the Kaaba, the cube-shaped building in Mecca. And Arabs would come from all over Arabia to pray to their gods at the Kaaba in Mecca. And the Quraysh had this thriving pilgrimage trade. Muhammad, when he started out, began to preach that there was only one God and that all the idols in the Kaaba were of false gods or demons, including Alat al Uzza and Manat. The Quraysh did not take kindly to this for two reasons. One, they liked those girls. And two, they thought that if Muhammad's single God became a widespread belief in Arabia, that the Arabs would no longer make the pilgrimage to Mecca to worship their gods at the Kaaba. Of course, we know that Muhammad solved that problem later by making it into a Muslim shrine, but this, that would be skipping ahead of the story. Before that, he, ha he hit on another solution, and his other solution was he got a revelation, as he often did at uh, crucial or convenient points in his career. And his revelation was Allah said to him, have you considered Allah, al Uzza, and Manat, the goddesses of the Quraysh? They are the exalted cranes, the Garanik. The Garanik are, are cranes like the, the, the birds that fly overhead and they fly very high and they are worthy of veneration. This was in effect saying that they were the daughters of Allah, goddesses indeed, and worthy to be worshipped. He had known he was going to do this. He, the, the, the Islamic tradition is, uh, is very interesting in how it reveals that Muhammad uh, insofar as he has any historical validity at all, but the stories portray a man who's really a rather self-conscious and very clever con man because he had called the Quraysh together with the Muslims and they were all there together in one room when he gets this revelation. So he knew it was coming. And the revelation comes upon him and he goes into his trance, falls to the ground, froths at the mouth, doesn't seem to be aware of his surroundings, comes to and he says, have you considered Allah al-Uzza and Manat? They are the exalted Gananik, worthy of veneration. And the Quraysh all say, hey, this is great. Now you've acknowledged our goddesses. And they all prostrate themselves and pray with the Muslims. And the next day, Actually, sometime later, Muhammad realized that he had based his entire case, his, all his preaching for years before this, on the idea that there was only this one God and all the other gods were false. And so, after that, he realized he had contradicted himself entirely. And so, he had to come up with some way to reconcile the contradiction. So, he said that Satan had actually inspired his revelation that the goddesses of the Quraysh were really goddesses. And he took it all back. And the Quran actually says now that there is no prophet that Satan doesn't interfere with his message. And so Satan gave him those verses and they were struck from the Quran. And now if you read the Quran, if you open your Qurans to chapter 53, <laughs> you will see that it says, in verse 19, have you considered Alat al Uzza and Manat, which is just how those verses started that he canceled? But then it goes on to say, you have male children, and he, that is Allah, has female children? That is indeed an unfair division. In other words, the Quraysh are crazy to say that Allah has daughters when human beings have sons, because everybody knows sons are superior to daughters. So it just becomes another misogynist passage in the Quran, but there's no trace of the earlier passage acknowledging that they were really goddesses. Now, the whole point of me telling this story is to say that the novelist Rushdie was basing his novel on a, true, on a story that is in the Islamic tradition. And it shows Muhammad in a very bad light, even in the original. It shows him as acknowledging himself that he was inspired by the devil, which is not the kind of message that Muslims generally want to project about Muhammad. So Rushdie made this rather fanciful uh, late 20th century 
postmodern kind of novel out of all this, but in the core of the story is this material about Muhammad being essentially inspired by Satan. So the Ayatollah Khomeini took umbrage and ordered that Rushdie be killed. And of course, in those days, this was the first salvo in what has become a very long war. And the West was absolutely enraged that the Ayatollah Khomeini would have the temerity to say that somebody should be killed for expressing himself, for creating a work of art, and for saying something that offended Muslims and put Muhammad in a bad light. But the Ayatollah Khomeini, of course, from his point of view, was simply enforcing Islamic blasphemy law. Islamic law mandates that if somebody mentions something impermissible about Allah, Muhammad, or the Quran, or Islam, then that person's life is forfeit, that person can and should be killed by anybody who has the opportunity to do so. And so you may recall Cat Stevens, you know? Yeah. He, Yes, Cat Stevens, who had recently at that time, right before all this, had converted to Islam. And he was interviewed on the BBC after the Khomeini fatwa. And he said to the, and the BBC said, what do you think about the Khomeini fatwa? And expecting him to say, oh, this is terrible and Islam is peace and we abhor all this. And he said, uh, oh, it's a wonderful thing. And he's absolutely right. And so the BBC interviewer was appalled. You can see this on YouTube. And he, he said, uh, so are you saying that uh, if, if, if you were in a restaurant and, the, and Rushdie was at the next table and somebody came in to kill him, you, would, you wouldn't shield him? You wouldn't stop him and call the police? And he said, no, I would hold the man, hold Rushdie down and make sure that the, the attacker got to him. And of course, this was even more appalling Cat uh, Stevens was roundly criticized for it, and there were very many great defenses of the freedom of speech at that time. But that was a long time ago, and since then quite a lot has happened. One of the main things that happened after that, that shows how much things have changed since 1989, was in 2005 when the Danish newspaper Jyllands Posten published a series of cartoons of Muhammad most of which were completely innocuous, but one of which have, has become famous or notorious, and it was Muhammad with a turban in which there was a bomb. One of those classic cartoon bombs, you know, that you only see in cartoons. And that Bugs Bunny always had. Now, the classic, the, 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 the bomb in the turban enraged Muslims to such a degree that there, once these cartoons were publicized in the Islamic world, and that in itself is an interesting aside to this whole controversy, because initially there was really hardly any response at all. But a, a Danish imam who was enraged about the cartoons took the original set of cartoons and he added three others, one of which was a man at a carnival with a pig nose around his face, uh, uh, strapped around his real nose. And the, the Danish imam said that this was a cartoon of Muhammad as a pig, which it was not, in fact. And several others that were a little bit more edgy, a little bit more directly offensive to Muslims than the ones that had actually run in the paper. And he took them, added them into a dossier that he made of these cartoons, and went around the entire Islamic world saying, you ought to do something about this. You ought to be enraged about this. It, brought, it came to the attention of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, which is 57 Muslim governments, plus that is 56 nation states and the Palestinian Authority. Since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation has been the largest voting bloc at the UN. It essentially controls the UN. You, you may know that at the UN, they condemn Israel practically every day. It's, it's, it's as regular as lunch. But they have nothing to say about genuine human rights abusers all around the globe. And they put Saudi Arabia on their Human Rights Commission, despite Saudi Arabia's very sorry human rights record. Now, why are they so hateful toward Israel? Why are they so charitable toward the Islamic world? Because the largest voting bloc, the group that can get what it wants and make the whole thing go in the direction it wants is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. 
And it was meeting that year in Mecca. And we're talking about Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, the king of Saudi Arabia, the various rulers of Egypt, of Turkey, of all the major Muslim countries and the minor ones. And they all got together in Mecca that winter. And one of the things that they discussed were, were these cartoons of Muhammad. And they decided that the bomb in the turban, plus the fake ones that the Danish Imam had added, were so offensive. Because, of course, who would put a bomb in Muhammad's turban? Everybody knows that Muslims have nothing to do with violence. But eh, these were so offensive that they decided to use them as a means to compel the West to restrict the freedom of speech. And there began, at that time, two-pronged assault. One was worldwide riots. And people, innocent people were killed because of these cartoons. The Danish embassies were attacked in many Muslim countries. And people were targeted just for being Christians because the association was, well, see, they're Christians, and so they're with the West, and Denmark's in the West, and the cartoonists were from Denmark, and they're insulting the prophet, so we'll kill this Egyptian Christian priest or Turkish Christian or something. There were Turkish nuns, I think. In, in any case, there were several people killed, quite a few, many, many violent riots all around the world. But at the same time, this was, in a certain sense, a good cop, bad cop routine. You know, when the bad cop comes in and he says he's going to beat you up unless you give him the information, and then he leaves, and the good cop comes in and he says, you know, he's really, he, he, he's really out of control. And I've got to apologize for my partner. And I'll tell you, I can protect you from him, however, if you just give me these, just some of the information that you've got. And I'll make sure he goes easy on you. And the guy falls for it and, and, and talks. And really, it's all just a choreographed performance. It's the same thing that happened with the cartoons. You had the riots all over. Meanwhile, at the UN, the OIC is saying, you see how you've incited all this hatred. You see how you have incited all this violence. And they put the onus on the West. It was Denmark's fault. It was the West's fault for having the freedom of speech. It was not the fault of the rioters. And since then, in sharp contrast to what happened after the Rushdie Fatwa, it has become taken for granted in the West that if Muslims get mad, it's our fault. If Muslims riot, it's because we did something wrong that we better stop doing. And this has become ingrained. Nowadays, it's taken for granted. But it all began at that time. At that time, the West had a choice. There, there are publications in every city. There are newspapers, <coughs> television stations, hundreds, thousands of them probably, all over Canada, the US, Western Europe, Great Britain. And they had a choice at that time. They had a choice to stand up and say, no, if you riot and kill people because of these cartoons, it's your fault. Your reactions are within your own power to control and nobody else is forcing you to do anything. And if I were to come up to you and say, you know, you're a really terrible person and you disgust me, you could hit me or you could say, well, you're crazy, I don't even know you. Or you could walk away or you could laugh or you could do a hundred other things, but it's up to you what you do in the face of any provocation. It's not up to me, no matter what I say or do. And so the West could have reinforced that principle, as it did at the time of the Rushdie Fatwa, by s printing the cartoons in every paper in the world, printing the cartoons in solidarity with the Jillens Poston, and saying, we believe in the West in genuinely pluralistic societies. What is a pluralistic society? Pluralistic society is one in which people have different views about core principles. And we're never going to agree on those core principles. And so we have two choices. We can try to gain hegemony, one group over the other, or we can put up with each other. And putting up with each other means putting up with things that offend us. Now, Jews and Christians have learned this. This is a foundational principle of Western modern society. 
And Jews and Christians have learned this very well, and they know that there are going to be people who insult people who Jews and Christians take very seriously and revere, and they do that. That's their business. And we live in this society where we all live together with different points of view in harmony. But the other alternative, of course, is for one group to gain hegemony over the other, to attempt to do so, and that means that the other groups have to bow to its own perspective and accept its perspective as being paramount, which is not a pluralistic society. Once one group's point of view becomes enshrined as the one to which everybody else must bow, well, then you don't have a pluralistic society anymore. Then you have an Islamic society or a Christian society if those are the people in power or whoever, or, or a communist society. So what is at stake here is the foundation of what makes Western civilization so great. What makes for people, in the, for the first time in the history of the world, really, what makes it possible for people of vastly differing perspectives to be able to live with one another in peace, which is a basic level of mutual respect and no attempt for one group to gain some kind of illegitimate hegemony over the other, which is not to say that there's not always the exchange of ideas and the welter, the, 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 the marketplace of ideas, which is well named because they are being sold and people are free to buy or not to buy. But when they're not free to buy and not to buy anymore, that's when we're in trouble and it's no longer a free society. And this is what's at stake here. They could have stood up the, cart the, the newspapers at that time. And every newspaper print the cartoons and said, we put up with insults. The Christians, they had the crucifix and the jar of urine. It got the National Endowment for the Arts grant. And Christians weren't killing anybody about it. They might not have been happy about it, but they didn't, they didn't kill anybody about it. And the, they said that they shouldn't have gotten the National Endowment for the Arts grant, but nobody would have said, nobody was saying at the time that the thing shouldn't have been made, shouldn't have been shown. That was their business. When rather instead the papers, for the most part, declined to reprint the cartoons, they were essentially surrendering to this initiative. And they were saying, you can get us to do what you want by rioting and killing and threatening us. And that means that we are now a society that is led by the principle of violent intimidation. That if you want to get the West to do what you want, then riot and kill and then the rest will fall into line. And this principle, unfortunately, has been abundantly reinforced since then. And it only enables the violent intimidation and asks for more. But it's not just about bullying. It's really about trying to get the West to accept those Sharia blasphemy laws that forbid any criticism of Islam. And that's the other prong at the UN. After the cartoons, and after the West failed to print them, and after the OIC said, you are at fault because of your freedom of speech, and you have to criminalize incitement to violence, and not incitement to violence, incitement to religious hatred. What that means is they want us to criminalize the freedom of speech. They want us to criminalize anything that insults Islam. Incitement to religious hatred is only something that they're worried about when the religious hatred is directed toward Islam and Muslims. And they don't even mean genuine hatred. They're talking about cartoons, for Pete's sake. In 2010, a cartoonist in Seattle named Molly Norris thought she would strike back against this. And she uh, started a Facebook page called Everybody Draw Muhammad Day. And she said, they can't kill all of us. If everybody drew Muhammad, and they're not going to kill the whole world and will defend the principle of the freedom of speech. Thank you, Mr. Rubio. And <clears throat> you didn't get that. <laughs> he's, I know he's old now, he's gone. I have to think of some Trump jokes. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, that's not hard at all. Uh, it's, it's a very controversial thing, and actually I'll get to him. Um, Molly Norris was then threatened. She's still on ISIS's list. They, uh, they, in one of the previous issues of their magazine, Davik, they uh, had a hit list of some of the people that they most especially want to kill, and Molly is still on it. 
This was four years after her uh, Everybody Draw Muhammad Day. Uh, she was notified that there were real threats against her by the FBI, and she elected to go into hiding and change her identity. And nobody knows where she is now. She might be here. And uh, anybody, Molly Norris? Hey, Molly. And uh, <laughs> the <clears throat> once again, the principle was reinforced that the West is no longer willing, as it was with Rushdie, to stand up for the principle of the freedom of speech. Molly Norris should have been immediately accorded protection by the U.S. government, immediately surrounded by 24-hour protection, and immediately become the hero of the so-called free media, and immediately celebrated in the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and everywhere else, and should have been ex used as a linchpin to explain to people why the freedom of speech is so important and why, if you give way on it, you're just opening the door to tyranny and destroying a free society. You cannot possibly have a free society without the freedom of speech. If there's one group that, that can say that you cannot insult us, you cannot say anything that we dislike, well, then they are in power. They can do whatever they want, and nobody can stop them. Because what could you possibly say? You say, well, you know, we don't really like what you're doing here, we oppose your views and they'll say, well, you see, you're inciting to hatred against us. And that's exactly what the Islamic groups have been doing in, in the US, in Canada, in Western Europe, all for, for, for decades now. And they can sign any honest examination of how jihadis use the texts and teachings of Islam to justify violence and hatred and supremacism as hatred, as hate speech. And then they're trying to criminalize hate speech. And it's also, it's gaining a tremendous amount of traction. One of the most disquieting things that I have noted over the last few years was uh, something that happened, it, it, it crystallized for me a couple years ago. I was speaking at Cal Poly, California Polytechnic University in San Luis Obispo, California. Beautiful area, very nice school, wonderful people. And I spoke, it was, uh, it was a very interesting evening there were three sets of, three tiers of, of uh, seats in this auditorium. And on the left were leftist non-Muslim students who were extraordinarily hostile. In the center were non-college people, uh, adults from the community who were very supportive and on my side. And on the right were Muslim students who were extraordinarily hostile. And so if I looked to the left or looked to the right, it was very hot. But if I stayed in the center, it was good. And over on the, on the uh, right, actually, there was a young girl who at the end, uh, in, during the Q&A, she said, I believe in free speech, but I don't believe in hate speech. And hate speech is not free speech. And I've heard that so many times since then. That was the first time I've heard it. Have you ever heard that? Yeah. It's an increasingly common theme. Hate speech is not free speech. And I said to her, well then, what you're saying is that hate speech should be outlawed. Hate speech should not be allowed, correct? And she said, yes. And I expect that the reason why we're having this conversation is because you believe that what I've been giving you over the last 40 minutes is hate speech? Yes. So you think that this whole evening should not have been allowed, I should not have been brought onto campus? Yes. Who do you think ought to be empowered to decide what constitutes hate speech and what does not? And she said, what? And this is where, see, it gets very hairy. I said, well, who gets to decide? I don't think I'm purveying hate speech. And I understand it's a minority view at Cal Poly, I'm sure, and at most universities around the world. But there is a considerable number of people who don't believe that to speak honestly about Islam and jihad and the threat that it constitutes has anything to do with hate speech. And who actually think that the charge of hate speech is a tactic designed to shut down discussion on this issue and to marginalize those who speak about it so that the jihad can advance unimpeded and unopposed. And what you're saying is that you want to entrust someone with an extraordinary power to determine what is acceptable to be discussed and what is not. 
And that person would be a tyrant who would rule over us and destroy the freedoms that we have in this country at this point. And she said, you're advancing a Hobbesian critique of the powerful. And I said, yeah, actually I am. That's good. I'll remember that one. Uh, <clears throat> if we give way to this, then everything is gone. Then the jihadis can advance and nobody can say a word. Because one of the most insidious things that the OIC has done over the last 10 years is in their Islamophobia observatory that they have. I, I, I really hope it's a brick and mortar building somewhere, you know, with uh, uh, all sorts of uh, telescopes looking for us and uh, <laughs> observing. Oh, there's Spencer. Look, he's walking down the street. And anyway, the Islamophobia Observatory publishes a report every year about Islamophobia. And in it, they include the uh, attacks, genuine and spurious, faked and real, attacks on innocent Muslims that creeps and louts and thugs sometimes perpetrate. And that's, there's no supporting that. Nobody is calling for attacks on innocent people of any kind in any place. But they conflate those with honest discussion of the motives and the goals of jihad terrorists. And anybody who, like me, shows, well, see, the jihadis, it's not really that they're poor and uneducated. It's that they're following the Quran, which says to fight the unbelievers and subjugate them under the rule of Islamic law. They say that's just as much Islamophobia as some idiot who grabs some lady's hijab and says, get out of our country. And of course, there's really no comparison and no connection whatsoever. But the idea is to advance the proposition that any discussion of the motives and goals of the jihadis is hate and has to be eschewed as a result. And of course, what's the ultimate goal then? If every one of us, everybody who does the job that I do, or something like it, if every one of us is silenced, if incitement to religious hatred, so-called, really becomes a law, and the Obama administration did sign on to a resolution to that effect at the UN, they just have this pesky little problem called the First Amendment that guarantees the freedom of speech and it makes it more difficult for them to enforce that kind of thing. But if they get their way, if they figure out ways to do it, Hillary Clinton, when she was Secretary of State, she had a three-day closed-door meeting in Washington with the then Secretary General of the OIC, Ekmeladini Sanolu. And it's never been discussed, it's never been disclosed what they talked about for three days. But it seems likely that they were strategizing about how the freedom of speech could be restricted in the U.S., even aside from the First Amendment. And I think she gave a hint of that when she said that we have to subject these people, these terrible hate mongers and such, to good old fashioned peer pressure and shaming. Mm -hmm. And it's worked very well. You gotta, you gotta hand it to her. She isn't gonna be the next president for nothing. The fact is that there has been a tremendous amount of peer pressure and shaming that has marginalized the whole, re whole resistance to jihad and make people think that there's something wrong with talking about these things. I mean, if you, if you go online, which I'm not recommending, and look me up, you'll see that I've done all these terrible things, most of which I didn't even know I'd done. And <clears throat> I'm just a terrible person in every way. And so, coincidentally, is everybody else who talks about these things. And yet, the Council on American Islamic Relations and all their fellow allied groups, the National Council of Canadian Muslims here, never do they show us somebody who opposes jihad terror who they like, who is not a terrible person. The idea is to demonize and marginalize everybody who does this so that there's just nobody doing it. And this is not just also the people who are high profile or relatively high profile. There's a very telling incident that happened a few years ago. There was a plot at uh, Fort Dix, which is in New Jersey, a military base, and there were some Muslims who incidentally were Albanian Muslims, and thus they were white guys. And they were going to go into Fort Dix and kill as many American soldiers as possible before they themselves were killed. Their plot was discovered. It was discovered by a 17-year-old boy 
named Brian Morgan Stern, who worked at a video store in the area. As it happened, these jihadis, they loved gory beheading jihad videos, but they had them on VHS tapes. So they went into Brian's video store, and Brian is there working, and they said, can you convert our VHS tapes to DVD? And he said, okay. And he's working, and I don't know how it works, but apparently he's seeing what is on the things as, as he's converting them. And so he sees all these horrible images, and he is alarmed, as he rightly should have been, and he went to his boss, and he said, dude, I'm seeing all this crazy shit on these videos. Should I go to the police or would that be racist? Now where did he get the idea that turning in six white guys who were plotting mass murder would be racist? He got it, of course, from the good old-fashioned old -fashioned peer pressure and shaming that Hillary Clinton has been recommending and probably abetting in no, in, in no insignificant way. He got it from how the Council on American Islamic Relations, the National Council of Canadian Muslims, all the other Islamic advocacy groups in Canada, the US, Western Europe, Great Britain, they have for years said that if you resist and oppose jihad terror, you're a racist. And young men like Brian have grown up in this world and they've internalized that. Luckily, to his credit, he decided to go ahead and be a racist and he turned in these guys. But how many others <coughs> have thought, how terrible it is that people are hating Muslims and how sh what a shame, you know, I mean, this is the pr primary dominant view. Such that last May, Pamela Geller and I organized a contest to draw Muhammad in Garland, Texas. Now, we did it in Garland, Texas, a suburb of Dallas, for a very important reason. In January 2015, the Charlie Hebdo cartoonists who had drawn Muhammad were murdered by Islamic jihadis. In February 2015, <clears throat> the several Muslim groups in the United States gathered in Garland, Texas at a hall where they held a conference called Stand with the Prophet. Now, standing with the Prophet is what the assassins in Paris had just done in murdering those who they thought had insulted their prophet. So we thought it was grotesque that this event was going on so soon after the murder of the cartoonists and that it was revealing also that it showed that they were not friends of the freedom of speech, not interested in living in a pluralistic society, but were tacitly giving their support to the assassins of the cartoonists and to the violent enforcement of Islamic blasphemy laws. So, <clears throat> we went down to Garland and held a demonstration outside their event. And at that demonstration outside their event, in discussions with some people, we got this uh, another idea. That the hall where they were holding it was a public hall. And so, they were open to anybody who was willing to pay the fees. And we decided to hold a Muhammad art exhibit and cartoon contest in the same place. And we did that on May 3rd, and of course, as you may know, it was attacked by Islamic jihadis who were killed by members of our security team, and nobody, nobody else was hurt. But in the wake of that... You should hold more of them. I'm sorry? I didn't hear that, I'm sorry. You should hold more of them. I don't know that we would be able to get a hall anywhere in the world anymore for that. But in any case, the a reaction after that showed to a vivid and disgusting degree how far we have deteriorated since the days of the first days of the Rushdi Fatwa. Because we were universally excoriated, actually Pamela was, even though both of us organized the event, she is obviously far prettier than I am and uh, just as articulate or more and so she was the one that the event was ascribed to and she was is subjected to universal opprobrium and abuse. Yeah. And Donald yeah. Trump told uh, Megyn Kelly that uh, she was just the worst advocate for the freedom of speech in the world. And what were they doing trying to draw Muhammad? Uh, couldn't they find anything else to draw? Everybody's well, Everybody's we weren't there to draw. <laughs> he should have known that. We were there 
Because when they kill people for drawing Muhammad, we have two choices, and only two choices. We can draw Muhammad, or we can surrender. We can draw Muhammad, or we can say, yes, you can kill us, and by killing us, get us to do your bidding, and we will surrender, and accept your sensibilities, and we will not draw Muhammad. Those are only two choices. Either stand and do what they, what they don't like, and our, the, 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 the American authorities, the American government should have been protecting us because they should have recognized the principle at stake, or surrender and say, yes, you're going to kill us if we draw Muhammad? Okay, we won't draw Muhammad. That's it. No, there's no other choice. So Donald Trump indi indicated in that that he didn't understand about the threat to the freedom of speech, the gravity of the threat, the importance of the freedom of speech itself, and how vital it was to defend it on particularly these grounds. And so it wasn't just him, though. I'm not picking on him in particular, although he's eminently pickable. Uh, <clears throat> the whole intelligentsia of the Western world seems to have lost this understanding. And to be willing to surrender on this point. And it is now government policy at the highest levels in the United States, in Canada, in Great Britain, to consider any exploration of the Quran, of Muhammad's life, of Islamic doctrine, as regards to terrorism, as being something hateful and a manifestation of racism and bigotry to be stamped out. And even to be considered to be on a par with Islamic terrorism itself and an equal threat. And you will find it's not hard to find at all <coughs> studies which say we have to fight against all forms of extremism anti-Muslim hate, which means criticism of Islam in regard to how it incites violence in a genuine way, and Islamic, well, they don't call it that, of course, violent extremism, which means Islamic terror. And so, at this point, this is the struggle that is going to come to a head. And it's going to come to a head one way or the other. At a certain point, there are going to be people in the West who are going to understand the importance of the freedom of speech for free society and defend it, or we're going to sur surrender and become essentially Sharia tyrannies. But they are going to keep pressing until they absolutely put forward all of Islamic law. And they're not going to stop trying to compel us and intimidate us into accepting it all. And so at a certain point, authorities in the West are going to have to draw the line and say no more. But nobody seems willing to do that at that point. And on that very happy note, I will stop because that is at, actually at this, the situation as it stands now. And uh, we can take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>